Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here with me uh, to uh, talk about this very interesting topic. Uh, I am very thankful for to the organization as well for allowing me to share my thoughts on this uh, fascinating phenomenon. Uh, and it is indeed a topic that is uh, very close to my heart. It's very dear to me uh, because in a sense, it uh, unites very different parts of, of my life. Uh, not only my experience as a language learner, but uh, also my profession, uh, what I do uh, every day at Langora as the head of the digital education team, and uh, also my interest in this uh, very uh, high level uh, uh, educational topics that are so important and relevant for, for students and learners, right? Yes, so uh, before we uh, actually go into the uh, topic, let me talk a little bit about myself and uh, you're able to see me here twice again, so <laughs> sorry for this. Uh, yeah, well, my name is Javier Santana. I am the, uh, the head of the digital education team at Lingoda. Uh, Lingoda is uh, Europe's leading online language school. Uh, we have served over 60,000 students in the um, eight years that uh, we uh, are around. And we offer private and small group live language classes. Uh, and this is important because uh, for us, uh, live interaction, live uh, uh, spoken interaction uh, with uh, native speakers, uh, with our, which are the teachers and also uh, other, other learners is, is at the center. So uh, spoken interaction is really um, at the core of, of, of what we offer and our concept. And uh, these classes are available 24 seven in our platform and are run by uh, over uh, 1,300 qualified teachers that are a part of our Lingora teacher community. Uh, students who take classes at Lingora follow a structured curriculum based on the common European framework of reference for languages, which is produced by the digital education team, that is my team. <laughs> and uh, yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, I am uh, the head of the digital education team, as I said. Uh, I have been at Lingora already for four and a half years. And uh, yeah, I'm leading the team of uh, instructional designers and editors in charge of uh, our more than uh, 3,000 lessons in Spanish, English, French, and German, which are the four languages that uh, we offer. At work. Okay, but uh, so much about me and Lingora. Let's uh, properly jump into this uh, topic. How does language learning shape your identity? Uh, probably most of you have uh, a certain degree of familiarity with uh, this topic. Uh, probably if you think about your language learning journey, uh, you might have experienced this uh, phenomenon that uh, uh, maybe when you open yourself up to a new culture, the culture in which uh, this uh, language is spoken that you're learning, you see that there are also certain traits of, uh, of your personality, of uh, the way you think about yourself, of the way that uh, you relate to others that uh, also change, right? And uh, this is a, a very big topic that has indeed uh, been uh, um, uh, studied and researched uh, by, uh, from many different perspectives. And uh, we will have a look at that uh, now. Uh, so let me maybe start with uh, some terminological clarifications, right? What is identity? Big philosophical question, right? It's one of those uh, traditionally difficult concepts uh, such as uh, truth, essence, substance, right? The big philosophical questions. Uh, but in a nutshell, the, the concept of identity is an answer to the question, who are we, right? And this is intuitively a very simple question, uh, but actually on a, on a second thought and looking at it properly, it does entail a very, uh, a very big complexity. And there are many uh, related topics that uh, are, are worth uh, proper research and having a closer look at. For instance, uh, one important issue or one important point of, uh, of research is whether identity is something stable, predetermined, more or less closed that doesn't change over time, or whether identity is something more fluid, more dynamic, something that maybe changes as we change and our circumstances change, right? In a sense, we are the same person, even if we change, right? We don't become like a different individual, but it might be so that we change so much that we uh, maybe start considering that we have a different identity, right? And then uh, another very important uh, um, topic that, uh, that is also related to the idea of identity is that of authenticity, right? Who is our true self? Uh, if we do embrace this idea that um, uh, identities are uh, more or less fluid and changing, and we can even have more than one depending on uh, the context, 
which is the perspective that does define our true identity, right? And in here, there are uh, many different factors that could play a role. And uh, for instance, is uh, the way I perceive myself, um, the way that I should consider is my true self, or is it the way others perceive me? Um, it is my personality, uh, it is my hobbies, it is my culture, right? Culture does play uh, a, a significant role in also uh, shaping the identity. Is it my job? Job is also uh, what uh, the profession is also something that uh, we typically ask someone when we when we meet them uh, for the first time. And also the social environment, right? Uh, we are in a sense not the same person when we are with friends, uh, when we are with our family or with our colleagues, and also not with certain friends and certain other friends, right? Uh, but of course, a factor that could not uh, uh, that that we should include here is uh, definitely that of my language, right? It's, uh, actually in plural, my languages, right? Uh, the languages that I speak um, is that uh, also something that defines my personality. So uh, in order to tackle this question, uh, you could actually look at the topic of identity from many different uh, uh, disciplines and many different uh, um, theoretical perspectives, uh, neurology, philosophy, anthropology, politics, right? Depending on, on where you put the emphasis, but uh, maybe one discipline that you would not necessarily expect in this constellation is uh, that of applied linguistics. <laughs> the one that uh, focuses, as you know, not only but also on uh, the science behind language learning, right? Uh, so applied linguistics also as a perspective or as a, as a research area uh, from which to tackle the perspective of identity. And uh, let's actually have a look at some of the uh, uh, definitions of the concept of identity that come from uh, uh, language researchers, right? The first one is uh, a traditional one uh, already, almost uh, from this classic book on the topic of identity and, and language learning by Bonnie Norton, published in 2000. There's a second version of this published in 2013, which defines identity as how a person understands his or her relationship to the world how that relationship is constructed across time and space and how this person, uh, the person understands possibilities for the future. And I think here there's an element that we want to highlight for sure. And that is this idea of the possibilities for the future, right? When we're talking about identity. We're not only talking about our past, about who we have been and who we are. We're also talking about how do we project ourselves? What are future paths of development in which we could evolve, right? And uh, definitely uh, the area of language learning, uh, as, you, as you can probably uh, read more or less guess and probably relate to your own experience, this is, this is key, right? And uh, the other uh, definition of identity that I wanted to point out, let me just morph myself to the side so that you can read that properly, uh, is that by Naoko Morita in her paper published in this book, Psychology for Language Learning in 2012, and that's this idea that uh, identity is uh, an individual sense of who they are in relation to the particular social context or community of practice in which they participate. And you can see already here the importance of this idea of the community of practice, which definitely will play, play a very important role. Right? So here you have some uh, definitions of the concept of identity from uh, directly from applied linguistics, right? Um, now, I would like to maybe uh, um, talk to you about relevant factors that affect our self-perception related to language, right? And in here, I'm really just going to show you uh, a brief selection because the list is uh, actually endless. And uh, I would like to maybe give you a glimpse into this complexity by, by highlighting some of the personality traits that are indeed tied to our identity that uh, are susceptible to, to change. Um, depending on, on the language that we use and also uh, through the process of language learning. One of them that you might have heard about is decision-making. Uh, do we make the same decisions uh, when we speak a foreign language? Is our train of thought that leads us to make a certain decision the same when we speak a certain language than we speak when we speak another? Uh, this is definitely a, a, a factor uh, to, to consider in terms of um, defining our identity in, the, in, in a different language. The sense of humor is also a very important one, and uh, we could make a whole presentation only on the relation uh, between the sense of humor and language. There's a lot of research only on this topic. Uh, humor is uh, definitely uh, something that is very closely tied to, to language. Um, 
And uh, it is indeed the case that uh, speaking a different language and being exposed to the, the social, the, the cultural context of a different language also does have an effect in our uh, sense of humor, right? Um, Politeness, uh, uh, we could not not mention it, of course. Uh, as you know, different languages have different structures to express politeness. Certain languages have even like specific pronouns to address someone politely. Some of the languages have different verb systems uh, to do this. Uh, the language that we use does have an impact on uh, how polite are we and uh, kind of encourages us uh, to use or, or to default to uh, certain uh, structures that could be more or less polite. Other languages, for instance, uh, have a preference for the imperative and are more direct, right? And this does have an impact definitely in uh, how we engage with others and how we perceive ourselves, for sure. Another one is being open to talk about feelings. This is very interesting uh, because uh, there is indeed uh, uh, research shown that um, speaking a foreign language in certain cases uh, does free ourselves up from uh, the, the normativity and the pressure that we uh, inherit from the culture in which we grew up and thus allow us to open up uh, to talk about feelings. Talking about feelings is uh, typically one of those uh, areas, one of those topics that is uh, quite, uh, quite tricky and quite sensitive and normal, normally we feel a lot of uh, pressure from different sources uh, to maybe like uh, hide them, to uh, not show ourselves so vulnerable, right? And uh, speaking a different language, that's also helping this, right? So because we don't have a lot of time, I will uh, focus on just one of these, uh, and that is that of uh, decision-making. Do we make the same decisions when we speak a foreign language? Uh, a 2014 research article suggests that the increased psychological distance of using a foreign language induces making decisions based on cult reason over feelings. This means that we are inclined to make different kinds of moral decisions if we are not using our mother tongue. And this is very interesting. Uh, the, the article uh, in which this research was published is called Your Morals Depend on Language, quite provocatively. <laughs> and this is very interesting because it's not depending on using this language or the other, right? It's depending on whether we're using our mother tongue or a foreign language, because by using a foreign language, we have a certain distance, right? And we are able to maybe detach from feelings a bit more, right? Uh, the term they use is not really like basing decisions on cult reasons, it's something more uh, along the lines of utilitarian decisions, but this is the idea, right? I just want to highlight that this is not necessarily always a positive thing. Um, in certain contexts, definitely uh, being able to detach from feelings is, is, is important to be able to be more objective. But it could also be the case that because we're using a foreign language and we're basing our decisions on cold reason alone, we're not seeing the emotional consequences or the, or the emotional connotations of what we're saying um, and uh, certain cultural misunderstandings and linguistic misunderstandings could also happen, right? So this is a fascinating topic uh, that uh, is definitely co completely tied to, to our identity, right? Uh, I had another couple of articles uh, about the sense of humor and also about being polite and subtle, but uh, due to time constraints, I will have to skip that. Um, let me focus a little bit on this, on this point, which I think is also very interesting. Two languages, two identities, actually not so simple. <laughs> it is not the case that when we learn a new language, we develop a new identity completely different from the previous one. And if we learn yet another language, we develop yet another identity and all of those are completely different, right? Um, it could well be, and in some cases, this is indeed uh, what happens, that speaking a second language also changes how we are and perceive ourselves also when we speak our mother tongue, right? So the result is not necessarily a sum of different identities. The result can also be a new identity that is affected by the practice of speaking more than one language, right? And in here, I do want to show you uh, an excerpt of, a, of an interview uh, published in this uh, research in 2014. It is an excerpt of an interview uh, of uh, uh, an American student who was learning Spanish in Spain. And listen, listen to what, what, uh, what they say. I often find myself speaking Spanglish to my Amer with my American friends. When my mom and sister, who don't know a word of Spanish, came to visit me, I found myself throwing Spanish words and phrases at them mid-conversation and then realized they must have no idea what I'm talking about. I like having the ability to speak Spanglish whenever I want and have my friends understand me completely. 
right? So this is very interesting because uh, what this uh, uh, speaker is, is experiencing is a new kind of way of communicating, uh, which uh, they learned uh, when learning Spanish. And now going back to English, actually completely back to English feels a bit strange, right? And it feels like there's a loss in there, right? And this certainly uh, does affect uh, the, uh, the identity and the self-perception of the speaker, right? Let's see another example also from this research, but it's a different student. Uh, I also noticed that I'll use Spanish words as if they were cognates in English, even when they aren't. For example, in Spanish, I'll say me cuesta, which means it's hard for me to do something. One day on the phone with my sister, I said, it costs me to do that. And she said, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Once she pointed it out, I realized and explained, but I wanted to convey the exact sentiment that me cuesta has for me and English wasn't really sufficient. I think this is very beautiful because it does show that uh, once we have learned the, the, the target language, we're actually able to express ourselves and, and to, to, we have generated new ways of communicating that we didn't have before. And then not using them actually feels like loss, feels like there's something missing. I'm not really able to express 100% uh, what I want to express, right? So this is, uh, I believe, some uh, very interesting consequence of, of this, of, of the process of learning a language, right? And uh, I wanted to also read to you this uh, excerpt from uh, also like uh, quite an old article at this point um, about uh, this process of uh, language learning in the relation to uh, um, identity formation, because I, I believe that it, it does show very well what, what we're trying to, uh, to describe here. Um, as Lantov pointed out from the sociological perspective, second language learners have a second chance to create new tools and new ways of meaning. Thus, accents and grammaticality and pragmatic and lexical failures are not just flaws or signs of imperfect learning, but ways in which learners attempt to establish new identities and gain self-regulation through linguistic means. I think here you have the key, right? So it's, it's not like just wrong, it's actually, you know, them trying to uh, achieve a new self in a sense, right? In an important sense, uh, second language learning is about gaining the freedom to create, a freedom that native speakers have a greater difficulty achieving, but to which children up to a point have access in learning their first language. I find this very beautiful, even if it's an academic text. Uh, 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 I think it does describe very well uh, what we're talking about here, right? Um, yeah. So let's now maybe uh, take a step back and uh, think about how this works, right? So we have talked a little bit about the effects of uh, language learning in, in uh, one's own identity. Uh, I also have some uh, uh, research articles to discuss with you about a uh, sense of humor and politeness, but uh, due to time constraints, I um, uh, wasn't able to, to bring them up. But uh, we have seen also uh, in a couple of examples of how language learning does uh, um, have an impact on your identity. But um, I wanted to maybe with you take a step back and think, what is it specific from language that um, brings us to creating and developing new identities, right? Uh, because we have seen that, okay, there are certain elements that are related to culture. There are some of uh, some other ones that are um, more psychological aspects and all of them kind of like cross and mediate through language and affect us, right? But what is, this, what is it specific about language that brings us to developing um, a new identity, right? And maybe in order to um, basically solve this question, what we could do is think a little bit about the concept of language, maybe try to conceptualize it in a way that allows us to understand what is going on here, right? So let's maybe talk about, in general, what is language, right? Another big philosophical question. Uh, you could write PhD thesis about this, many, many pages, uh, actually many PhD thesis have already been written about this. And uh, yeah, the question that philosophers and linguists have discussed um, many times in the, in the past. Uh, but I, when I explain this, I'd like to maybe distinguish two main um, schools of thought, so to speak, uh, that more or less capture uh, two fundamental ways of understanding language that uh, I believe um, um, throw some light into this issue. The first way of understanding language is the most traditional one, and that is that way uh, of, of thinking about language as a kind of knowledge. So language is something that you go to school to learn, you study hard to learn, 
It is a subject matter among others. You have uh, language, but you also have uh, physics, chemistry, maths, etc. Right? It's something that you study very hard uh, to to properly uh, acquire. You learn all the grammar rules, all the syntax, all the vocabulary items, and at some point, if you uh, if you keep learning, you might even become an expert, and at some point, become even a professor. Right? You can go to university and study language. Right? This this uh, social phenomenon that we normally consider knowledge, academic knowledge, theoretical knowledge. Right? However, and of course there is a however, uh, if you think about language the way you use it with your friends, the way you use it with your family, the way I am using it right now, and the way we use it uh, informally in our everyday situations, it is not really necessarily uh, that we are thinking about knowledge and then applying that knowledge, right? Uh, we, we, we don't say what we say because it is prescriptively correct. We actually say what we say simply because that is what we normally say. That is what we're used to saying. And this is because language is first and foremost actually a habit, something that we're used to doing, something that we do every day, something that uh, we know we have to do in order to achieve a certain communicative goal. For example, if I'm at a restaurant and I want to uh, ask for the price of something, uh, I will directly ask, how much does it cost? I will not think about, uh, okay, question word, how, then adverb, much, changes the question word into quantity, then the verb to cost, I have to conjugate it and put it in a question form. I don't do any of this, right? This is not something, this is not the mental process that is going on in my head now. I just simply know that I need to say this language bit in order to achieve the communicative goal that I want to achieve, right? And this is because uh, in order to apply knowledge, what you need is awareness. You need to be aware that this is the grammar rule. You need to be aware that this is the vocabulary items. This is the syntactic rule that you want to apply. In order to gain that awareness, you need to study hard. But in order to perform a habit, you don't really need awareness. You don't need to be aware of what you're doing. What you need is actually confidence. You need to be sure that this is what you need to do in order to uh, achieve the communicative goal that you want to achieve, right? And in order to gain that confidence, what you need to do is to practice. You need to uh, have done the same things many, many times in order to uh, gain this confidence that then allows you to uh, perform linguistically in the context that, um, that you are uh, aiming at, right? And uh, just to summarize this, this idea, so when you are applying knowledge, what you're doing is retrieving information from your long-term memory into your short-term memory, right? This is what I mean with awareness, right? This is the, the awareness element is basically having it in your short-term memory. But when you're performing a habit, you're not really using your short-term memory. What you're doing is retrieving information directly from your long-term memory, right? Uh, because you're not really aware of what you're doing. You really are just using it in a, in a very almost automated way, right? And and, and this is interesting because when you're fluent in a language, you typically are able to use your short-term memory for other things. You're able to multitask. Language is not something that uh, occupies your, your mind, right? Whereas if you're still struggling with uh, learning a language, you're, you're not yet fluent. You haven't yet developed the habit of, of speaking the language. Um, uh, you're still using your short-term memory. You need to think about, okay, what was the rule? Uh, how do I fit this word into this sentence, etc. right? So. Uh, very important difference. Uh, and if you think about this, uh, for instance, um, an, an interesting question is, what is the analogy that you would use to, to describe uh, a language? Would you say that language, speaking a language is like, uh, or learning a language is like learning maths, uh, where you always have the same rule and uh, you always get the same results, so to speak? Uh, formulas are like grammar rules and numbers are like words. Or is it more like playing a sport? where in a sense you need to know the rules of course this is a condition right like you cannot uh, maybe skip the rules or, or play against the rules so to speak but what really will make you be able to speak uh, the language is actually doing it right and uh, the same goes for a sport right so um, i think you know separating this and focusing on this difference is is, is very helpful and you will see where I'm getting at because we're talking about identity and we're talking now about uh, knowledge and habit. Uh, of course, I wanted to highlight this because habit formation is closely tied 
to identity development. And this is also uh, another uh, research article published in 2019 that collates data from two studies testing the assumption that habits are associated with identity and if, uh, if this relates to uh, important goals or values, right, as is the case with language learning, for instance. Uh, the results suggest that habits may serve to define who we are, right, the big question of identity. In particular, when these are considered in the context of self-related goals and central values. So this research article was not mm, focused necessarily on, on language learning, but I'm, uh, what I'm proposing is to make this connection to understand language learning uh, and speaking a language also as a habit and, uh, and then seeing how this is tied to um, um, the idea of developing a different identity, right? And uh, yeah, uh, just to highlight this, uh, I want to uh, also uh, propose to you this um, explanation that James Clear offers in his book uh, about atomic habits. Uh, and let me just read that loud because I think it's very enlightening. Your habits uh, are how you embody your identity. When you make your bed each day, you embody the identity of an organized person. When you write each day, you embody the identity of a creative person. When you train every day, you embody the identity of an athletic person. The more you repeat a behavior, the more you reinforce the identity associated with that behavior, right? Uh, this, is, this is very interesting because in a sense, your habit is the evidence that you give to yourself in order to reinforce your identity. Right? And the word identity in itself uh, means, uh, comes from late Latin, identitas, and uh, which is equivalent to Latin identitan, meaning repeatedly again and again. And identity itself means something like repeated beingness, what you do regularly, right? So you already have this element of, of the habit, even in the etymology of the word identity, right? And um, just bringing that back to, uh, to, the, to the idea of language learning and language in general being a habit, I think the word habit and the concept of a habit is very interesting to apply in this context of applied linguistics because it can define uh, language learning both in the, in the sense of describing the learning process. So in order to get to master a language, you need to get into the regular habit of practicing as a learner, you need to take classes regularly, interact meaningfully with teachers and materials, etc. And it also defines the goal, right? So speaking a language is a habit in itself because of what I was explaining to you, right? So um, uh, speaking a habit, uh, or sorry, speaking a language is a habit in the sense that um, uh, you need that confidence that allows you to know in order to uh, perform communicatively in this context, in order to achieve this communicative goal, uh, I need to you know, use this linguistic uh, um, element or this linguistic structure or this linguistic or this vocabulary item, right? So the idea of a habit actually describes language learning, describes language learning both from the perspective of the learning process and the final goal, right? So just to sum up uh, the idea that I tried to uh, convey to you here, uh, in order to uh, then properly learn, learn a language and become fluent in a language, you need to, in a sense, not just learn it, right? You need to also be a learner, right? You need to assume the identity of the learner. And of course, also in terms of the goal, uh, don't just speak a language, actually be a speaker. Consider uh, yourself as embodying that, that identity. Uh, and yeah, engaging in the right kinds of habits will lead to reinforcing your identity as belonging to the language learning community and also the community of speakers in the, of your target language. And then for a long-term commitment, uh, such as language learning, developing a habit is really the only way to achieve that goal. And as with all habits, don't just do it, be it. Right? And yeah, thank you very much. This is everything that uh, I wanted to present to you and uh, will also explain to you a little bit this, uh, this idea, uh, which is also at the core of what we do at Lingora, by the way. Um, we offer a platform that uh, where, where we encourage our students also to develop this language learning habit uh, as, as much as we can. And yeah, 